Hello. Hello. Hey. <laughs> um, so uh, tonight, um, tonight's lecture is the first of two events uh, associated uh, with uh, an exhibition that's been. I'll just I'll just wait for a couple of people to move in. Um, so tonight's uh, the first of two events associated with an exhibition uh, curated by uh, Frauke Jürgenhans, um, sitting across the table here um, at the Moody Centre for the Arts, um, called Urban Impressions: Experiencing the Global Contemporary Metropolis. Um, it's, it's been up now for a couple of weeks, so I encourage you all to go uh, and see it. And um, uh, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Alison Weaver, the director of the Moody Centre for the Arts, and Igor Marjanovic, the dean of the School of Architecture, for supporting the two events uh, uh, in association with Frauke's exhibition. Unfortunately, uh, Dean Marjanovic cannot uh, be present. Um, he's uh, a little unwell and can't be with us this evening. Okay, yeah. Damn kids. Thanks, <laughs> um, Yeah. Okay, um, uh, so tomorrow um, I wanted to let you all know there's um, a symposium. Uh, tonight's lecture is the first event. Tomorrow there's a symposium uh, at the Moody Centre in the Lois Charles uh, Theatre. Begins at 10 a.m. Uh, the the symposium is called Reading the City. Perspectives on the Contemporary Global Metropolis. Um, uh, we hope uh, some of you will join us. Uh, we, um, there's no registration required, Frauke. You can just show up um, and uh, there'll be time to see the exhibition and, um, and lunch and uh, 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 five great speakers, uh, some of whom are here. Gotcha Gunel, uh, Associate Professor in uh, Anthropology. Takena Koko, um, a, an architect who works um, with the arts and in landscape architecture. Uh, Fabiola Lopez Duran, a professor in art history with her, um, uh, will be presenting with Giovanna M. Basi Sendra. And uh, Sindhu Tulmasami, who's uh, here, um, a new member um, uh, of the faculty in the um, uh, Department of the Visual Arts um, and Dramatic Arts um, on campus. And of course, uh, our own Frauke uh, Josenhans Jos will also be presenting um, uh, as well along with Walter Ben Michaels. Um, so we encourage you to come to the symposium uh, tomorrow beginning at 10 a.m. Um, we've asked the speakers tomorrow um, uh, to consider how the representations of artists uh, are transforming our understanding of today's globally urbanized environment with its all too obvious, but evidently not obvious enough, crises and injustices. Um, and I can think no one, uh, of no one better to discuss this question than tonight's lecturer, Walter Ben Michaels, um, whose theory and criticism uh, is fundamentally concerned with representations of our neoliberal condition, be that works of literary fiction, contemporary art photography, or the work of theory um, and criticism itself. Uh, Walter's uh, central thesis that post-structuralist theory and post-modern conceptions of representation are inextricable from our lamentable political economy and its appalling and growing inequality um, is uh, presented in kind of astounding lucidity um, and always incredibly provocative. Um, the compelling need to be able to disagree about things as opposed to just have differing points of view uh, is uh, one of Walter's core uh, arguments and, um, and today, no doubt, um, one of his most controversial. Um, Walter is a, a theorist of literature and the visual arts, a professor in the Department of English at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, and I'm just gonna mention a few uh, of his um, uh, publications from an incredibly long list um, of books and essays. Um, his 1982 essay against theory published in Crit Critical Inquiry, authored with Stephen Knapp, um, uh, an essay on authorial intention, um, gave rise to a, a book, um, a, an essay that gave rise to a book um, with figures um, such as Stanley Fish, Richard Rorty and Edie Hirsch. Uh, the Shape of the Signifier from 2004 at the intersection of uh, literary and art theory um, with its kind of fascinating reading of Michael Fried. Um, uh, the book, The Beauty of a Social Problem, uh, published in 2015, a synthetic book of uh, essays um, on contemporary art photography. Um, there's kind of a central reading on art photography alongside 
uh, Michael Fried's uh, Why Photography Matters as Art as Never Before. Um, and uh, more recently, um, just published in Non-Site, um, an essay with Adolf Fried um, called The Trouble with uh, uh, Disparity, an essay um, uh, kind of following on from uh, 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 Walter's earlier book, The Trouble with Diversity from 2006. Um, and uh, Walter is uh, publishing with Adolf Reed a uh, book called no, Politi no Politics But Class Politics, which is um, due out uh, in January, I'm told. Um, so uh, we should look, look forward to that. Um, and then also Walter's been um, uh, engaged with, uh, or flirting with uh, issues of uh, uh, architecture increasingly um, over the last few years with um, a student of ours, Sebastian uh, Lopez Cardozo. There's a, um, uh, an interview in Platt, our student journal, uh, that's um, from uh, a couple of issues ago. Um, and uh, Walter's also published an essay in Paul Preisner's, uh, the architect Paul Preisner's uh, recent monograph called Kind of Boring. Um, so given the subject of uh, Frauka's uh, exhibition um, and the fact that this talk is happening in the School of Architecture, um, uh, the, the subject matter seems uh, absolutely, absolutely perfect. Um, Walter's going to talk uh, on deindustrial aesthetics and discuss a kind of pivotal moment, um, in the, uh, a pivotal kind of historical moment, the intersection between uh, architecture and photography. Um, that I think um, is, is absolutely well suited to the subject of the exhibition. So uh, looking forward to um, the talk. And so uh, please uh, join me in uh, welcoming Walter Ben Michaels to... Uh, yeah. So thank you. Are we good with this? Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Scott. Uh, thank you all for, for having me here. Um, it's actually really a relatively new experience that you suggested for me to be doing things at schools of architecture. Um, I, I'm really grateful for one thing. I don't know if this is really a feature, but the main school of architecture I've spent time in and given talks in has been the one at UIC. And it too has like students sort of all around there. When we give a talk in English, you know, there's like books, and it's like quiet, and sort of funereal. And I've always been struck by the fact that UIC people give talks it's like people talking all the way through. So I felt very at home when the students were active. And no doubt they'll just pick up again in a few minutes. Um, I don't, this isn't, I have started writing a bit about, about architecture, but I don't want it all. Um, one of the pleasures for me uh, has been learning more about various discursive structures in the world of architecture. Um, it's actually kind of thrilling. I mean, when they asked me to do the thing in Platt years ago, that came out of the blue. But then here, I was given a very nice tote bag with a copy of a relatively recent issue of Platt. And I opened it up and like, there's Nicholas Brown, who's my colleague at UIC. There's Todd Cronin, who's the uh, executive editor of Nonsite. Looks like a kind of Nonsite goes to, um, to, to architecture, which is kind of encouraging. Um, the one thing I'll say about this talk, uh, which has to do with Nonsite, which is a journal that some of you may be familiar with, an online journal, and has a kind of, it's a very um, sectarian journal. It's completely a kind of doctrine, two sets of doctrines, one uh, political and one aesthetic, and the claim is that they're both in some way a version of the same thing. Um, a lot of collaborative work gets done that way. One of the things I admire about architecture is how deeply that's built into the structure of architecture, and the talk I'm going to give today is in some sense a collaborative one. It's written by me, all the, as all the sentences are written by me, but the ideas as much come out of uh, collaboration with my colleague, uh, Belgian colleague at, in uh, Brussels at the, uh, the Université Livre de Bruxelles, uh, Daniel Zamora. So, um, and I talk a little bit about a different work that Danielle has done sort of toward the end. So I'll just say then one more thing about this. That is, two thirds of this talk is about neoliberal aesthetics. Uh, not quite one third of it really is more straight political. Um, so the straight political stuff is at the end. And my sort of fond fantasy is people can, in my view, they're not really separable, but we can sort of think about them separately. Um, although I'd be completely happy to discuss the question of the political as it gets raised here. And if I weren't happy to discuss it, I wouldn't have raised it, but I do. I don't say much about cities, but I do say a little bit about housing policies in Houston, just as a kind of exemplary instance of housing policies in the US in general, with respect to the piece that, um, that Scott mentioned that I co-authored with Adolf Reed, The Trouble with Disparity. That is about the logic of disparitarianism. Okay, but most of this is like about 
not exactly about disparity. Disparity comes out of it. So a standard account, I'm talking about the Bechers maybe today. So if you haven't been in New York, the great Bechers show is up in New York. It's a familiar topic. Everybody knows their work. Uh, a standard account of their lifelong photographic project, an account to which they themselves were super committed, emphasizes its preservationist or perhaps memorial ambitions. What they wanted was to preserve a record of what they called the sacred buildings of what Burnt in particular would call the industrial age. A record that was endangered because as soon as the structures they were interested in, steel mills, coal mines, stopped being of use, they tended to get closed down. Thus, an equally standard Besher story is of them arriving just before the record does to take pictures. Or in one case, having scouted their location and then postponed shooting for a couple of days of them discovering that the record had come before them and the structure was gone. Hence, the photographs are pictures of the industrial age taken at the moment in which that age was coming to an end. Pictures of, the, of industrialization taken from the industrialization. That's why Lucy Saltain calls her essay for the catalog of the recent exhibit at the Met, quote, a post-mortem for industry. Their, quote, subjects were endangered when they photographed them, she says. Many, if not most of them, are now extinct. But if there's a sense in which that's true, many of the buildings they photographed were indeed about to be demolished, there's at least as important sense in which it's not true. In fact, it's more or less the opposite of the truth. Even though not just the Bechers themselves, but virtually everybody who has ever written about them discusses their work in terms of the effort to document, quote, the disappearing industries of ore mining, coal mining, and steel production, everybody also knows that those industries haven't disappeared in the slightest. So one of them's coal, one steel. In fact, the production of both coal and steel was going up when they started photographing in the late 60s, early 70s. And the, um, and photographing the mines and plants they understood to be on the edge of destruction, and as those graphs show you, has continued to go up since. So it's always a little bit bizarre that they're about the passing of the industrial age. If we take the core of the industrial age to be the production of steel and coal, it's not only not passed, it was just like in its infancy, only 30 years ago, in terms of actual production. So if there's a sense in which it's true, it's, there's a sense in which it's not true, and these numbers they've just put up also suggests, though, another way of looking at the phenomenon. Coal production in Europe, Western Europe, which is where the Becker started, declined from 467 million tons in 1955 to 279 in 1972, largely because of the decline in the price of oil. That's the disappearance that the Bechers were seeing on site. The decline in steel started later in the 70s, and in the US was particularly catastrophic in the early 80s after which, with occasional recession-driven downward spikes, production in the U.S. has remained stable. China, by contrast, has gone from nothing to now producing over half the world, world steel. So if you were looking at where the Bechers were, you would indeed find closing mines and, and steel plants. But if you not, if you were looking in Fujian. When the blast furnaces they photographed in Germany were torn down, it wasn't because no one needed blast furnaces anymore. Indeed, on a trip to China, Hilla is said to have seen a steel, steel mill they once photographed in Germany, reassembled, which is just to say that the age of industrialization slash deindustrialization is at least as much a geographical as it is a temporal phenomenon. Or it might be better to say that it's an economical phenomenon. When Burt characterized their project as documenting the sacred buildings of Calvinism, and Hilla added, that the mills and mines, unlike, say, the sacred buildings of, of Catholicism, were constructed, this is a crucial uh, measure concept and crucial to this talk, for functionality alone, with no consideration of so-called beauty, their point was that the buildings we photographed originate, she says, directly from this purely economical, purely functional um, thinking. When they lose their function, Hilla says, they're no longer entitled to exist, so they're torn down. The question of economy, she thinks, is thus built into them. But we've already begun to see the sense in which these buildings were no longer functional is a slightly complicated one, since buildings very much like them were proliferating all over the world, which is a point that gets made in a different interview when they're asked if they'd be interested in traveling, say, to Korea, if they heard about an industrial edifice they had yet to photograph. 
Hiller enthusiastically says yes, but Bernd expresses a certain skepticism. Hiller was in Siberia, he says. There weren't any variations that would contribute a great deal to the whole, let's say on the subject of blast furnaces. We already have enough of them, he said. So for them to travel to Asia would be irrelevant because the buildings you see won't really add anything. You might even encounter a blast furnace you'd already photographed, and even the ones you hadn't would, wouldn't look very much different from the ones you had. As one engineer puts it, the blast furnaces used today are similar in form and function to the ones built about 260 years ago. Making pictures of the 1970s, the Bechers, for whom form and function, although a kind of complicated account of the relation between them, were, uh, are everything, making pictures in the 70s, they were photographing the blast furnaces of the future as much as they were the blast furnaces of the past, blast furnaces of today, as much as the ones of 1930. But the fact that the structures travel, that you can see in Korea what you can no longer see in the Ruhr, is entirely relevant since it raises the question of what exactly is meant by thinking of a blast furnace in Germany as having lost its function, which is to say what exactly its function is. One answer is a construction designed to convert iron oxide into pure molten iron through the application of heat and the presence of flux and coke. Its function is making steel. But if we ask the question in the context of the Bescher's interest in the fact that the blast furnaces are shutting down, which is why they're making photos of them in the first place, right? that's the, the default position, the answer is not making steel, it's making steel for profit. They're closing them down not because they can't make steel, it's because they can't be profitable making steel in the rule. Making a profit is the functionality they've lost. The Bechers describe blast furnaces as the purest version of the purely economical architecture they were interested in because there was no possibility for any aesthetic consideration in their construction. Everything about them is determined by their function in making steel. But if blast furnaces exemplify an architecture that's purely economical because making steel exhausts their purpose, blast furnaces on the verge of being torn down exemplify an architecture that's economical insofar as making a profit exhausts their purpose. So two different accounts of what the purpose is. So the first point we would make is that the Bechers are photographing the difference between these two functions, between making steel and making steel for profit. Because in the expanded field of the deindustrial, functionality is itself a function of profit and loss. And this expansion of the field is in no way a relic of the past in need of archival preservation. Just the opposite. The Bechers identify the economic thinking embodied in the construction of blast furnaces with Calvinism. The expansion of that economical thinking, represented by adding their demolition, would be identified with neoliberalism, or perhaps in less material terms, but by the marginal, with the marginal revolution and the rise of the idea that, as Ludwig von Mies put it, the crucial thing was to see that economical thinking was everywhere. Because everything we do, von Mies says, is an attempt to substitute a more satisfactory state of affairs for a less satisfactory one. In case you don't know who von Mies is, I just put the little thing up at the top. That's from like one of the millions of von Mies fan sites that are like all over the internet. So basic, I mean, the guy's completely serious, but this is, I love the tone of it. That is well known as the best defense of capitalism ever written. So, you know, whether it is or not, I don't know, but that's sort of very characteristic of the discourse around it. So von Mies says, because everything we do is an attempt to substitute a more satisfactory state of affairs for a less satisfactory one, an exchange, Mies wrote in Human Action, when we succeed, we profit. When we fail, our action produces a less desirable state of affairs. And he says, the difference between the valuation of the result and the costs incurred is called loss. So for von Mies, all actions can be understood under, in fact, the sign of profit and loss. For Mies, the building of the blast furnace, the building of anything, requires, indeed, embodies economical thinking right from the start. Indeed, as he sees it, not only is all action economical insofar as it involves exchange, but because, quote, it necessarily aims at future and therefore uncertain conditions, it's always, quote, also speculation. 
In fact, it's always, again, quote, a risky speculation. What does the capitalist do? He makes steel to sell at a profit. If he is correct in anticipating how much the consumer will want his steel, he succeeds. If he isn't, he fails. Of course, for many actions, consumer desires never come into play. So in the more properly philosophical field of the theory of action, which underwent a renaissance in the second half of the 20th century. So I put up there two major figures. The first is Donald Davidson, or the first is Elizabeth Anscombe, um, whose been, work has extremely been important to me for like the last 10 years. Um, on the cover of the Anscombe book, you can see Davidson's totally accurate account the most important work since Aristotle, the theory of action, and then next to it, Davidson. For many years, uh, there was what was called a Davidson-Anscombe, uh, or Anscombe-Davidson theory of action. In fact, however, Anscombe and Davidson are in many ways deeply opposed, and that opposition will be central to the next portion of this talk. So for many, consumer, for many actions, consumer desires never come into play. In theory of action, Davidson and Anscombe, profit and loss doesn't come up. But in some analyses, speculation is nonetheless built into the structure. When a man presses the brake pedal in his car and causes the car to stop, what he does is physically apply pressure to the pedal with his foot. If he has, in Mises terms, correctly anticipated the chain of events that will be produced by the pressure applied by his foot to the pedal, the car will stop. The risk is, if he hasn't, if, for example, he wasn't aware of a leak in the brake fluid, it won't. The example is Donald Davidson's, not Mises. And the model of action is that what a person does is move his or her body in such a way as to set off a desired chain of events in the hope that that chain of events will indeed follow. Or as Davidson famously put it in 1971, we never do more than move our bodies. The rest is up to nature. In Mises' terms, the gap between what we do, press foot on a brake, and what happens, the car does or doesn't stop, is the speculative moment. Mises' actor, modeled on the entrepreneur, never does more than move his body. The rest is up, not exactly to nature, but to the market, which of course for Mises are virtually the same thing. What Mises has then is a primitive version of Davidson's causal theory of action. Whether causal theory is a good theory is an open question, and one I'll come back to. But it does have the disadvantage, as Elizabeth Anscombe pointed out in Intention, and as an Anscombe-inspired series of philosophers has more recently emphasized, of turning what one might more plausibly think of as the description of an action into its result. So I am breaking a description of an action turns into, on the Davidsonian causal model, I am moving my foot in a way that I hope will cause the car to break. So it's a fairly straightforward distinction, but it's kind of a crucial one for this. There is the, the, the Anscombian version of this is, what are you doing? I'm breaking. The Davidsonian version is, what are you doing? I am moving my foot in a way that I hope will cause the car to stop. But from Mises' standpoint, the standpoint of what we might call a capitalist theory of action, that difference is a feature, not a bug. Why? Because the difference between I'm braking and I'm moving my foot in such a way that I hope the car will stop is the difference between I'm producing steel, like I'm braking, and I'm producing a commodity that I hope will sell at a profit in the market. More pointedly, it's the description of making something as making something to sell. And more generally, it's the redescription of all action as the expenditure of human capital of all action as a form of entrepreneurship. From this standpoint, the fact that the mines and mills the Bechers photographed were in some sense completely functional, the very opposite of industrial ruins, is crucial. If this blast furnace could no longer produce steel, a picture of it could not be a picture of no longer producing steel for profit. So the, it's a picture of no longer producing steel and therefore can be understood as a picture of no longer producing steel for profit. It couldn't be a picture of what I'm suggesting it is, at least in part, a picture of a market. It's a picture of a market. And also from this standpoint, 
even the preservationist account of the Besher's relation to their subjects begins to look much less relevant. That is, their work looks less like an archive of exhausted functionality and more like a rethinking of what functionality is, of what it means to make something to do something, and especially if we think of them as artists rather than as archivists, of what it means to see something as made to do something. That buildings, architecture, should play a central role in any consideration of what it means to make something is unsurprising. In fact, it's traditional. In, for example, Hume's critique of the argument from design for the existence of God, not only is the house the exemplary instance of something made to fulfill a function, the steps of stairs, one of his you know, dialoguers says, Cleanthe says, are plainly contrived that human legs may use them in mounting by the architect. Um, it's the model by which we can see that, that model is the model by which we can see that human legs themselves are contrived for walking and mounting. So Cleanthe's point is just as the architect designs the stairs for walking and mounting, God designed our legs for walking and mounting. And thus we see in our own bodies the presence of the designer. Of course, Hume rejected that analogy, arguing that we could not treat the natural world on the model of the house because <clears throat> where our experience of houses leads us to conclude with the greatest certainty that they were made by an architect or builder, our experience of the natural world, he thought, does not. Kant, by contrast, would be interested in disconnecting rather than connecting the house and the fact of its being designed. In the logic, Kant asks us to imagine the difference between a house as seen by a wild man and the same object as a, habit see, as a habitation intended for men. His interest here is not in the way that nature might or not might not bear the marks of contrivance, hence of a designer, but in the idea that something that actually is contrived will be experienced differently by someone who knows what it's contrived for. So what he calls the mere intuition of the wild man, his idea is the wild man sees it, the wild man doesn't know about houses, so the wild man just sees what he calls its appearance. And that's different. He sees the house as if it were nature. But the man who knows its use, combining intuition with concept, sees it as a habitation. So he thinks there are two ways to see it, which is actually a crucial thing for contemporary aesthetics, as we'll see in a minute. From this standpoint, it's interesting that the photographer James Welling, talking about the framework houses that the Bechers started making in the 60s, describes them as made to produce, quote, an almost childlike legibility. See, mommy, this is what a house looks like, Welling writes. The wild man can't see that they are designed for habitation, but the child can. But this is not because the houses produce the effect of a functionality as extreme as the blast furnaces, designed only to fulfill a single purpose, and thus always at risk of supersession should that purpose become irrelevant or should they fail to fulfill it. On the contrary, although their book, Framework Houses, calls attention to the 1970 law that restricted the use of wood and forbade construction elements serving only ornamental purpose. So that's why when they were interested in the framework houses, they always thought of them as part of that industrial age as functional because the effect of the framework is a function of the effect of the limitation on the amount of wood you can use and therefore the refusal as they thought of a certain kind of ornamentation. But it's obvious the effect of ornament that the use of timber nevertheless produces is obvious. And it's made more obvious by the Bechers in, ones, in works like the one you're looking at, where the pictures are almost arranged to display what Welling calls the crazy cat angles made by the timbers against the stucco. The blast furnace, on the other hand, really does eliminate all aesthetic possibilities. With some large industrial structures, the Bechers acknowledged, aesthetic conditions are possible to a certain extent. But with blast furnaces, heat, pressure, and gas generation overrule aesthetics. And in their presentation of the blast furnaces, there's nothing like the ornament of the framework houses. An ornament that in the houses, since it's the effect of an insistence on minimizing the wood, is built into their skin. So again, if you just look at them for a second, built into their skin precisely as an effect of functionality. So that's what you're looking at, that skin there. Whereas the blast furnace, they actually kind of brilliantly say, is like a body without a skin. 
its insides are visible from the outside, organs, artilleries, and skeleton create its form. Indeed, the blast furnaces make visible the degree to which many of the other Becher subjects, so take famous water towers, most obviously those, are made legible by the shapes their skin allows them to display, and that they derive an aesthetic appeal from those shapes. By contrast, because the blast furnaces are hard to read, and because they do indeed seem to have no skin, their shapes are hard to see, and their aesthetic claim is not made by anything in the structures themselves, no ornament. Um, not even really by the play of form that the typologies exist in part to produce. Rather, it's tied directly to the functional, or more specifically, to the fate of the functional. For although the wild man who sees the house without seeing it as a house is introduced by Kant at a moment in the logic, there's nothing to do with aesthetics. It entered aesthetic theory in an essay written by the literary theorist Paul Deman um, in 1983. So actually, if this talk has a kind of like a center, the, this slide is the center to it. Um, so Deman writes a kind of a remarkable essay, Phenomenality and Materiality in Kant. So Deman is now in a kind of eclipse, and I've always regarded him as a crucial figure because I think he completely understood the logic of the position he held, even though that position is, in my view, like exactly wrong. Um, so he starts, he writes this in 1983, and he writes a set of essays, 77 and 83. You can see the Besher Blast Furnace is one. This is a picture made in 83. And just to keep the de-industrial in our heads, you can see that in, in Youngstown, Ohio, 1977, September 19th, was remembered as like the beginning of the end of that. You might also remember that in the 2016 campaign, Trump went back to Youngstown and promised that um, some of these steel plants would be reopened. And, and so I know I'm in Texas, so Texas is a little bit different, but maybe not here. But you can figure out, um, without going on the internet, whether those plants were in fact reopened. So of course, here it is, it entered aesthetic theory, this question of functionality, in an essay written by Paul Deman in 1983. Um, and of course, the importance of refusing the functional had by way in part of Demand's reading of Kant on the sublime already in the 1970s become very central to literary and art theory. Um, Kant says that to find the ocean sublime, right, which is to separate it from functionality, we must not think of it as we ordinarily do, as for example, a vast kingdom of aquatic creatures or as the source of those vapors that fill the air with clouds for the benefit of the land. So we must, in fact, be like wild men seeing houses. We can't see any of the, it's, we can't see their functionality. We need instead to see it, he says, as poets do, which becomes a crucial concept, seeing it as poets do for Devon. Which is, as Devon points out, just the way the wild man sees the house, as it appears, quote, to the eye and not to the mind as if we could separate those. So instead of seeing the function of fulfills, filling the air with beneficial clouds, we must see it only as a clear mirror of water bounded by the heavens. It is this wild man's vision of heaven and world entirely devoid of teleological interference. That's Demand's phrase. So no purpose, devoid of teleological interference. That constitutes what Demand calls a material and a purely aesthetic vision elaborated in this essay and several others. The point here is not just a Humean one, though we must disconnect our vision of the natural world from the sense that the things we see in it serve some purpose. It's pretty easy to see the ocean non-teleologically. The point is that this disconnection must be expend, extended to what, as in Davidson's, we only move our bodies, the rest is up to nature, might be seen as the very site of purpose, of intentionality. That is, Demand particularly insists on Kant's remark that even when looking at the human body, we must, quote, disregard the concepts of the purposes which all our limbs serve. And we must not allow this unity of purpose to influence our aesthetic judgment. So Davidson's, you know, we must only move our body, we only move our bodies, rest is up to nature. It's as if Kant is actually saying, no, start to question the body. 
Daman understands this as an instruction, an exhortation to, quote, consider our limbs the way the primitive man considered the house, entirely severed from any purpose or use. In aesthetic vision, we must not see the sky and the ocean as fulfilling some purpose. We must not see the house built precisely to fulfill a purpose as fulfilling a purpose. We must not see our own limbs at work, say, in building the house as fulfilling a purpose. It's a kind of radicalization of Davidson. In art, we don't even move our bodies. Everything is up to nature. Thus, the difference in Kant's logic between an intuition in itself and an intuition informed by a concept becomes the difference between the aesthetic and the functional, um, which means that the difference that structures the Bescher's interest in their endangered buildings between the functional and the ornamental needs to be redescribed. Remember, they're saying it's not ornamental like, like churches were, it's all functional. The idea that these buildings are about to be demolished because they no longer serve a function and have no aesthetic qualities, the idea we began with, no ornament, turns into the idea that they're no longer serving a function is itself an aesthetic quality. According to Demand, the, or according to Demand's version of Kant, the aesthetic quality. Something like the blast furnace, which was only functional and not at all ornamental, when rendered non-functional, becomes aesthetic without ever having been ornamental. It's as if the ornamental has been revealed to have a function after all, the function precisely of ornament. And the blast furnace is here presented as the site on which an aesthetic that is in no way functional, it's not about making steel or about making beauty, emerges. This is the exact opposite of a functionalist aesthetic. It's, it is, in Demand's version of Kant, the ability to see the structure without seeing what the structure is for that constitutes seeing it as the poets do that constitutes the very idea of the aesthetic. In this sense, there's a crucial tension between the fact that every Bescher work bears the name of the function, the structure served, you know, uh, these are, are blast furnaces, frame houses, tipple towers, all things like that. Um, they have the name of the function, the structure served, while at the same time, they present their own condition of possibility pictures themselves as the effacement of that function. And if I've emphasized Demand's Kant, it's because the logic of Demand's material vision is also the logic of what the Bechers called the purely economical, which I began by suggesting was not the logic of use, but of what Mies called speculation. Mies's idea was that because the success or failure of an act always depended on something outside of one's control, action was itself a form of speculation. Purpose the steel mill, not to make steel, but to make profit. And the question of whether it did make a profit was up to consumers. The theory of action here, the agent as entrepreneur makes the steel to make a profit, is causal, and its more sophisticated form would drop the economics but maintain the causal structure. Thus you remember, Davidson's model of action is you move your foot to move the brake pedal to stop the car. But precisely because event causality structures his understanding of action, he thinks it's a mistake to include the consequence of the act in its description. The act is, you pressed with your foot on the brake pedal. The question of whether the car did or didn't stop is a consequence of the act. From Davidson's standpoint, it would be a mistake to think of the act itself as speculative. What you did was build a steel mill. Going out of business was a consequence. But for Davidson and Mies both, the purpose of your act gets redescribed as a possible consequence of it. Your act becomes one event in a causal chain that may or may not lead to a hoped for result. So you wouldn't exactly say the entrepreneur made the steel with the purpose of selling it at a profit. Hoping to make a profit isn't exactly the same as intending to make one. But redescribing all purposes as more or less well-founded hopes and thus making what the agent was trying to do relevant to what actually happens only in the way that a cause is relevant to the effect it produces, this model of action is at the heart of the materialist version of the Kantian aesthetics we've just described, and indeed is at the center of what I've elsewhere called neoliberal aesthetics. We can begin to see the aesthetic part just by noting that some or another version of the intentional fallacy's rejection 
of the artist's design or intention as relevant either to the meaning or success of the work has been hegemonic in modern criticism for over half a century, particularly in the form, different forms deployed by theorists like Bart, Derrida, and Foucault. So the Foucault thing is too long, I didn't put it in here. I was struck by the Bart because I'd never noticed it before, but I started working on this, the body version of theory of action. So I was just struck by the fact that um, Bart writes, literature is the trap where all identity is lost, beginning with the very identity of the body that writes. So it's as if Bart is already imagining the writing body. And actually imagine the writing body is essentially, yeah, you make a mark and the rest is up to what? Nature. Um, so put the Bart up here. More to our point today, that is for today's uh, discussion, um, since Duchamp's Fountain and its renewed impact on the late, in the late 60s, the refusal of the identification of intention with meaning has become crucial to the very idea of what a work of art is. When Thierry de Duve reminds us of the relevance of a term the Bechers often use to describe their work, anonymous sculptures, he's in effect describing them as found objects. Their purpose no longer relevant. It's left to the artist as beholder and then to all the subsequent beholders to decide for themselves whether what they're looking at is art. But why is this aesthetic neoliberal? Well, we've already begun to see why. Davidson's causal model of action, all we ever do is move our bodies, it's up to nature, finds its economic elaboration in Mises' speculative model of action, all we ever do is move our bodies, the rest is up to the market. The speculation is on what effect the cause will actually produce, profit, loss. And both are underwritten by the aesthetic that makes the purpose with which the art was produced relevant only as its cause rather than its meaning. All we ever do is move our bodies, press the button on the camera, say, or the letters on the keyboard, or the mark with the pen. The rest is up, since Duchamp, to the reader or the beholder. But what we've just described here so far is the replication of a structure, these three different all we ever do's. We haven't really shown how this structure, especially in its aesthetic form, functions in and for a neoliberal political economy. One thing we might say here is that for someone like Mies, passionately hostile above all to the idea of a planned economy, that was for Mies and Hayek, the great uh, bugaboo. The understanding of action as intrinsically speculative functioned to instill the price mechanism of the free market into nature, that is, into human nature. And for neoliberalism more generally, the privileging of the role of the beholder or the reader functions as a model for what economists call consumer sovereignty. More specifically, we could point to the way this privileging of the subject position of the beholder, rejecting the autonomy of the work by redescribing its intended meaning as its hoped for effect, offers not only an ontology of the work designed for the market, but also a theory of justice in that market which is to say, a theory of justice that must be understood as justice within the market. Just sticking to what has turned out to be one of the two exemplary structures for this talk today, and going by way of the 2022 report on the state of housing in Harris County in Houston, produced by the Kinder Institute here at Rice, we can see how that works. In formulating the terms, uh, in formulating the problem in terms of racial disparities, the report identifies the central problem as unequal access to the housing market. And since, as many scholars have shown, there can be no doubt about the U.S.'s long history of redlining and other discriminatory practices, um, current efforts to solve the problem are efforts to fight housing discrimination, as many government agencies and nonprofits are, of course, trying to do. Um, or even, if that seems insufficient, to provide reparations in the form of mortgage subsidies, which is actually something that's being done in Evanston, just north of Chicago. The goal of such efforts is to attempt to remedy the problem of unequal access to capital, to make it possible for people who have been excluded from the market to enter it. It's not to find a non-market solution. There are only 3,934 public housing units in the city of Houston and 17,610 units available for voucher for a total of 21,544 units that are in some way partially and occasionally substantially financed by the state. 
Those are both very small numbers. It's like what in Chicago is called, just getting underway now, the nation's largest test of universal basic income, um, which is very basic. It's $500 a month and not at all universal. It's going to 5,000 people. This reminds me of time. So for when Jennifer, my wife, and I first met, she was teaching at Cornell, and I was teaching at Johns Hopkins. If you were driving from Johns Hopkins up to Cornell on Route well, it was 83, right? You got to a point where you got a big sign that said, endless mountains, next six exits. So you always thought, if you think, universal basic income, 5,000 people. So even more intense here. But the similarity runs much deeper than the tiny numbers. Just as the effort to fight discrimination in the market is not an effort to find alternatives to the market, but to eliminate the discriminatory noise from its pricing mechanisms, housing voucher plans like guaranteed income plans are not alternatives to the housing market, but what, in their new book, uh, Anton Yeager and my uh, co-author in our new project, Danielle Zamora, call welfare for the market. Since the goal is to keep people in the housing market rather than offer them non-commodified housing. The installation of discrimination as the preferred, that is preferred to exploitation, enemy of equality, embodies the commitment to the market as literally the structuring principle of human action. Only in a society that has completely accepted the horizon of the market can the complaint, for example, that property values are not rising as quickly in majority black neighborhoods as they are elsewhere in the city, and hence the quote, black households are losing opportunities to build a wealth for the next generation. Only in a completely marketized society can that complaint be imagined as coming from the left. And it's that complete acceptance of the horizon of the market that we began by seeing in the Bescher's fascination with Calvinism's purely economical architecture and in their identification of the purely economical with the about to disappear, where the about to disappear is understood as a function not of technological change, but of market efficiencies. Furthermore, and this is where I hope you will feel the force of neoliberal aesthetics, it's the same conception of the purpose understood only as the cause of the action and therefore as irrelevant to the experience of the beholder that's at the heart of the identification of the aesthetic as the non-purposive, which locates the Bescher's work conceived as the presentation of anonymous sculpture as ground zero for the conjunction of the neoliberal and the aesthetic, since the, it's the omnipresence of the market that turns these entirely functional blast furnaces existing only to fulfill the purpose for which they were built into entirely non-functional works of art, counting as art because they serve no purpose at all. But of course, that description, the one I've just given, like the famous fact that they were awarded the grand prize for sculpture rather than for photography at the 1990 Venice Biennale, underplays the degree to which what is at least equally visible in the Bescher's work is what has led Jesse Visayas here at Rice to describe it as, quote, one of the most cohesive and coherent archival projects in the history of documentary photography. So I have a little problem with archival and documentary, but what I'm interested in there is cohesive and coherent. Especially if we see this project as aesthetic rather than archival or documentary. What emerges is not the valorization of the unintended that is absolutely characteristic of neoliberal aesthetics but almost its exact opposite, the extended structure of purposiveness. Individual photographs taken as parts of projects that extend through many years, in fact, in their case, a lifetime, produced according to protocols designed to make them look as if they've been photographed in the same way. You've seen already lots of examples of that. Um, so that they are visibly belong to the same project, while at the same time, they're constructed and displayed in a mode so distinctive as with the typologies that the work is completely individualized and identified as made by them. If the market theory of intention understands our purposes as the first cause in a series of causes and effects, a series the intentional character of which becomes irrelevant once we press the button on the camera or the letter on the keyboard, the Bescher is seen by contrast to have produced work that exists 
on the way their intentions run all the way through it. This is a different way of thinking about action. If a house rose up not made by men, Elizabeth Anscombe wrote in 1957, it would nevertheless, quote, be identified as a house because of its visible likeness to what we produce. Houses. Her point is not any more than Kant's was, a cultural one. Kant's idea, radicalized in demand, is that we can, and in art, we should try to see the appearance without adding to it the attribution of purpose. Anscombe's idea is that this is exactly what we do not do. Rather, even were the house somehow not made by men, we would see it as if it were. That is, we would see in it not just the effect of some cause, but the product of a particular action. And to see action in it is irreducibly to see it in terms of its purpose, to see it as the telos of the actions that produced it. Distinguishing Anscombe's account of intention from Davidson's, Frederick Stoutman says that for her, to use a hammer is not to cause it to move, and thus cause a nail to move, which causes the two pieces of wood to stick together, which causes whatever, but to perform instead, using a hammer, one of the bodily movements that constitutes what she calls the structured activity of building a house. And of course, that goes back to uh, Aristotle. The click of the button on the Bescher's large format camera is embedded precisely in that structured activity. Welding says that as a photographer, what he responds to in the Bescher's is everything from, quote, the excitement of finding a suitable object to photograph, so they find a steel mill, to what he calls the joy of setting up the tripod and the camera in the right place, um, all the way through the pleasures of working in the darkroom, confirming a negative you spent hours preparing to expose, I'm quoting Jim still, was perfectly exposed and processed. Two, once the prints are made, what he brilliantly calls joy continued administratively, as you arranged and rearranged grids of images, sequence books, hung exhibitions. Why is joy continued administratively brilliant? Because it focuses on the degree to which their work demands our attention to the relation between two very, between many very different movements of the body, insisting that we see them not as a series of events, I move my body, then what happens, but rather as the structured activity of making art. So coming to conclusion. The way the philosopher Jennifer Hornsby puts this point is to say that where actions are in question, intention does the work of unification. And the way we would put the point is to say that where intention does the work of unification, the Bescher's art, far from producing the aesthetic as the refusal of purpose, produces it as a kind of essence of the purposive. An event has innumerable causes. An action has only one purpose. It's as if for the Bescher's what it do art does is reclaim action from the causal logic of the market. How? First, because to see the art in terms of action rather than appearance is to recognize that it demands to be seen as what someone has done rather than as how it appears to us, and therefore that it demands to be understood. Second, to recognize that it demands to be understood is to recognize that its meaning is in no way a function of our response to it. We contribute nothing to its meaning. If the question of what a blast furnace is doing can be represented as a question about its relation to consumers, the question of what the Bescher's photograph of a blast furnace is doing has nothing to do with its beholders. Third, to understand the Bescher's blast furnaces in this way is to understand them as adhering to a conception of art that refusing the idea that action itself is a market phenomenon refuses also the idea that the politics of the work of art should be understood as a call for justice in the market. The point here is not that there's a housing or an industrial policy built into these pictures. It is, however, that there's a principle from which you might adduce such a policy. Nothing is more common today than the call for artists, architects, and even professors to see our work as political. I believe, uncontroversially, that whether we see it that way or not, it is political. But more often than not, in our conception of what art is, in our conception of the place of authorial intention, 
and of the contribution of the reader or beholder, more often than not, our politics is, at least from the left, a bad politics, a defense, however unwitting, of contemporary capitalism. What I've tried to do this evening is sketch out an account of aesthetic production embodied in the work of the Bechers that offers an alternative to that defense. Of course, no art can actually do the work of a working class politics, but it can at least refuse to do the work of what we have now. So I just put the uh, total family wealth thing up because it came out last week and um, it's a useful reminder. So the other useful reminder I didn't put up for you because I didn't think to do it until we were driving over here today before was a, um, a slide that I like to use at almost every university that I give a talk at, and that is of the median family income of the students enrolled at the university. At Rice, it's $160,800 a year, which is a lot but not in the top 20, if you're thinking about the American university system. OK. <laughs> um, uh, we should open this up for some questions, <laughs> if anyone, anyone has them. Graham. Should I pass this up, or is it? We have, we're, we're zooming this into the world, and so this is... So yeah, sort of he should have a microphone, because the zoom won't work. Thank, thanks for that. There's, uh, there's a lot to, to dig into. What, one thing that was sort of gnawing at me um, when you were talking about the Davidsonian idea of action and the example of the brake pedal, I couldn't stop thinking that what's interesting about that um, is that that's an intended action that only functions when we forget about the intention, which is to say, if you become too self-conscious, just as if I become self-conscious about my talking now, all of a sudden I'll start totally. to stutter. <laughs> it's the same thing there with, with breaking. If we begin to think too much about what we're doing with our feet, it doesn't work anymore. And so I'm, I, I, I guess I was curious how that would play yeah. into the way that you're using that it's an idea where actually we, we have to forget about intention in a way. Yeah, um, so and it only functions as an intended act if we, if we don't think about our intention. So. Yeah, so the thing would be, if you think of intention as a mental state, then everything you're saying would be true. But part of the point of kind of Anscombian theory of action is not to try to characterize it as a mental state. Indeed, the mental state tends to go with the causal theory. Like you have an idea in your head, and then you, the idea in your head causes you to like move your body, and then you move your body to touch the brake pedal, and then you go on like that. Anscombe's kind of basic idea, here's a famous um, saying which sort of came out of her work, and that is, I do what happens. So instead of, and the way she put it was, you don't start to think about intended actions by thinking about what someone is thinking. You start by thinking about what they're doing. And the point was that they're logically open, such actions, to the then question, so why did you do what you did? So the point would be that with many, many of our actions, just like the ones you're describing, and what I'm doing right now, if I stop to think, you know, I, I like notoriously don't stop to think before I speak sometimes, but if I were, but all of us would have a hard time like not making that happen, right? And the point's going to be is that, but if someone says, well, why do you use the word so-and-so, then you actually can explain why you use the word so-and-so. So the point really is for her, importantly, to disconnect a certain idea of intention as mental states from, in fact, what she thinks we ought to mean by intended actions, and to think of it instead as a kind of logical claim about the sort of thing which, if asked, we can give an account of the reason we were doing it. And of course, the reason might still be wrong. There's not a necessary claim in there that we always have the best accounts of our actions. I mean, notoriously, you know, anybody who's ever been to a therapist, a therapist at some point, if he or she is any good, will say, you think you did that, you know, to express love for your mother. You actually did that to express the radical ambivalence you have about both your parents, and all, like whatever it's going to be. So the point is not a kind of mental clarity about your intentions. The point's rather the logical structure of intention. So yeah, I completely agree with that, you know? And actually, you think about that too. I mean, just think of the Bechers. It's not as if the moment Hilda presses the button, it's like, okay, 
you know, I gotta focus all my attention on pressing the button. What is the, I mean, sometimes there are photographers like that. You might imagine that a certain kind of photographer is looking, a kind of Cartier Bresson, right? Who's looking for the exact right moment, presses the button at the moment he sees it. But for the bachelors at that point, you know, the way Welling outlines it, they set up the tripod, they've done this, they've done this, pressing the button was like goes without saying. But if someone said, why did you press the button? They wouldn't say, oh, fuck, I have no clue, <laughs> right? I mean, the point there would be, no, you've got a kind of structure of an action. But if you said, what are they thinking while they press the button? If that's what you meant by intentionality, then it wouldn't matter. I mean, you could be thinking, you know, they could be thinking, uh, you know, dinner is in half an hour. Um, or I hope it doesn't rain or anything they're thinking. So the question of the intention has to be disarticulated from the question of what one's thinking. So that's totally on target. In the end, as you're describing it, sort of the question I raised fits perfectly within your larger point yeah. that you focus on at the end, which totally. is to say it's the structure within which the intention functions. Totally. totally. And that's sort of the claim you're making for the, yeah. for the Besch's photography. Yeah. Yes. So, no, you, so, I mean, uh, so from your, my, my standpoint, your question is like a super friendly one because it sort of brings out what's meant to be one of the kind of useful parts of this way of thinking about intentional actions and where intention is completely linked to the question of action. Yeah. I wonder if you might speak a little bit further about the aesthetic intention. So I, I think one of the things about the Beshers is, of course, they're, they're staging every shot perfectly. They're also always presenting in a grid format in the, in the idea of a multiple. And I thought it was fascinating that you chose to show Duchamp, who, of course, was all about the authorial intention of this is art because I declare it's art. So I wonder if you could think about, I, I was just interested more in like the, there's the action, the physical action and the ramifications, but there's also the aesthetic intention. And I, I wonder if you just expound a little bit more on that aesthetic yeah, piece. So and the, like I, mean, I guess I would say two things. First of all, while you're right, the typologies and the grids are super famous. You know, they had, they had a lot of ways of doing it. I mean, the, the books are so, I don't have one. I've been so surrounded by Besham books that I feel anywhere I go, I want to look and see, oh my God, you had another copy of something. But if you have, the books are not grids, right? The books have some grids in them but they're often just individual photographs. They did many different things. If you got a chance to see if anyone, if you get to be in New York, I think it's the next week or two, the Besher Show is truly a spectacular show of all dying to the work. So, but when you say the aesthetic intention, I mean, this would be a good way of going back to like, you know, what the, what the remark was before. It's not like they're thinking, ooh, I want to make art, right? It's they're thinking, but what I'm claiming is that that's what they're actually meaning to do at every moment. It's that they're thinking, no, I want to make the thing look like this. I want to make these connections. So the typologies, right, which are ones like, um, yeah, so that's not a good, I mean, in a way, that's my favorite typology because it doesn't do what a lot of the others do, which is that one thing that people say about the typologies is that you can really compare and contrast the structures and you see the things brought together. And one of the things about that, I mean, maybe it's just me, but I can look at that for a long time and it's so hard to see those blast furnaces that you think, yeah, I just don't, I, I'm not seeing like um, this, where right away you see the sort of formal differences between them. So for me, what their work is, is precisely a kind of, you know, extended meditation in action on the idea of what the aesthetic is. And the point would be, and that's why, I, you know, I think a more standard account on one side is that it's memorialist and archival, and also very beautiful, which no doubt true. Uh, the account, that a kind of more ambitious account, is that it's aesthetic because precisely the Bechers understood that for a thing to become an object of aesthetic appreciation, it has to be disarticulated from its instrumental use. So it's one thing to look at it, you know, I mean, the, the, this is the Duchamp model, right? It's one thing to look at a urinal, it's another thing to look at the urinal if it's actually put in the context of art. And what makes it in the context of art is that you don't go piss in it, right? So the urinal turned into fountain, you couldn't go piss in. But we all know that you can reproduce that innumerable times. And that what you want is it's the disarticulation from use, the thing that you can't use it. That's the mark of the aesthetic. 
So my argument, right, is that both the first and the second thing are wrong. The second thing is wrong not because it's not true and the Bechers are completely interested in the question of what it means for something to become aesthetic by being separated from its function, but it's because what they are interested in is the way in which it is, in effect, repurposed as art. That is, in which their intentions are made visible all the way through, that that's what makes it a kind of work of art rather than the separation from the intention. So the, 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 the water tower, the, uh, the blast furnace, separated from its function, becomes an object in the market, becomes a, a, what I was calling a picture of the market, a picture of the difference between like the use function of making steel and the exchange function of making a profit. Um, and then though made into a photograph where the where the focus is no longer on the anonymous sculpture, right? That is the, the blast furnace, but on the making of a photograph out of that sculpture. Then going back to all the things you described, like the famous cloud, you know, skies, the famous just enough ground so you can see what the thing is, the famous exhibiting them so that they all look like they're roughly the same size, when sometimes these things are this big and sometimes they're like, you know, way, way bigger than that. All those things then become the marks of their intentionality. All those things become the marks of their producing a kind of work of art that is identifiable as in a certain style with a certain set of characteristics. So it's that, it's the creation of that that is actually at the very heart of the aesthetic. And that's why in the end, the blast furnaces kind of work best for me, as I sort of think they did for them in a certain way, because the blast furnaces are the least beautiful. In other words, they're beautiful things. And you know, everybody has like, Maybe not everybody has, but if you were, if you're as old as I am and you were sort of around doing this stuff in the 70s, like your whole fantasy of what you wanted hanging on your wall was a Becker typology. And, you know, if you could get a poster of the Meshers thing, that's what you had like in your desk to look at, to sort of think about it. Because they were beautiful, right? They were beautiful, but they are also challenging even in a way that one didn't quite see. So part of the thing is if you wanted the beautiful one, you would not go for the blast furnaces. But what you would get from the blast furnaces is precisely the way in which even the Bechers at that moment disarticulate beauty from, disarticulate the aesthetic from, be from the beautiful. So a lot of them are beautiful, right? Um, and it's not a problem for them. But even the ones that aren't beautiful are actually, especially the ones that aren't beautiful, are actually getting at the problem. Because the ones that aren't beautiful are precisely producing this disarticulation from the purposive, from the functional, rearticulation with the intentionality of art and that becomes for them neither you know whoops neither neither blast furnace nor Duchamp. So it's deeply anti Duchampian, right? In, for, in my view. It's the exact opposite of all that postmodernism is in effect derived from or you know whatever you want to call it derived from Duchamp. in the sense that they are sort of uh, from the same generation. Then, uh, so I'm sorry, I missed the name. Louis, Louis Baltz, the American photographer. Yeah, yeah, oh God, Louis Baltz, sure, sorry. Yeah. So, because in his case, he's photographing the new, in, the new industrial parks, which are not, not becoming obsolete, but rather appearing in the horizon, right? And so where there, there is... Uh, Somehow there's a symmetry and there's a, there's a, a lot of commonalities in the aesthetic, but you cannot make the argument about the obsolescence of the, of the object. Yeah, so, I mean, that's the kind of good question that, you know, is a good question because I have the faintest clue how to answer it. I mean, I, I know Valsa's work and your description of it seems totally accurate. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I guess I don't mean this in a... In a, in a um, you know, pejorative way at all, because uh, I don't know Bauss's work well enough to be pejorative about. I've never been super struck by it, so I haven't really thought that hard about it. I do, I would say, just like quickly, I don't think that, um, you know, if you think of all that group of photographers that comes up, and, and Bauss is the only one, I don't think that 
I don't think that the particular structure of photographing the about to disappear is kind of crucial. I mean, it's crucial for the Bechers. It's completely crucial for the Bechers. But I don't think it's the only way to make serious photography that might plausibly be constructed as a kind of alternative to the neoliberal aesthetic. Um, I don't think it's the only way to do it. I, I think that rather they would have to be, as it were, in, individual answers. You know, the one thing I learned, so like, like if you do literary theory, I started out my career mainly as a literary theorist. If you do literary theory, the whole point is to get answers to everything. Like, you know, the claim and against theory that texts mean only and always what their authors intended. It's not like someone says, well, I, you know, is that true of poems? Yeah, it's true of poems. Is that true of shopping lists? Oh, shopping lists. It's true of everything. If it's true, it's true. So one of the things I learned from, uh, from Michael Fried was, don't say that about art. <laughs> it's not true about art. Art can work, do, try to do similar kinds of things in very different ways. So yeah, it's just like a long way of saying I, it's something to think about, but I don't really know the answer. But I don't at all mean to imply that this is the only way to think about this question of the industrial. Right? Just that it's crucial for the best. It is, it's really striking. You know, if we all think about it, when I put up that, that graph of the coal industry and the steel industry, I mean, no one here is really surprised. Right? We know that they haven't stopped making coal and steel. What is climate change all about? It's not like if they'd stopped doing coal and steel in the 1970s, we'd be in a very different place <laughs> from where we are with that. And yet, I mean, Lucy Sante is like a super smart person, and her essay is like a pretty good essay. But it's actually called whatever I said it was called, which was the end of the industrial, something like the requiem or postmortem for the industrial age. And you want to say, whatever the postmortems are now, they are not for the industrial age. So it's very striking, right, that for the Bechers in particular, this kind of mythology has taken hold. And a mythology that they themselves are not exactly attached to, but not, they, they were never concerned to deny. And I, I think that's important. What's important about that is that precisely something like what we used to call, and maybe we'll call again, globalization um, is important for them. But now when globalization is understood as more or less the complete subsumption of everybody's economy in a larger market economy, and where it then becomes the case that to see something torn down in, that the epitome would be to see something torn down in the Ruhr is to see it built in, uh, in, in China, um, or to built in Korea, or built in whatever. And that it's that moment in which, you know, the first thing that sort of started me on this was the idea to think through what it meant then to think of these as photographs of the market. So, you know, I don't think what Erebaltz is doing is I think about the photographs in my head now that he's photographing the market. So the question would be is that could we rescue him from a certain kind of sentimentality in the idea of photographing these new environments that we would all regard or many of us regard as in some sense deplorable. And probably we could rescue him from that sentimentality. But the important thing, right, is that expressing disapproval so there was a period when we used to go, I mean, we still go to a lot of photography shows, but Jennifer said at one point, it's like every single photography you go to, show you go to actually has the title, Bad Thing Has Happened Here. Right? And the point was, that's the kind of sentimentality that the measures completely avoid. That is, they're not taking pictures of bad things. So if you look at, for example, a photographer whom I admire and came to know a little bit um, up in Chicago last week, Richard Mizrock. So if you look at Richard Mizrock's petroleum photos, they're, they're pictures of like bad things happening, you know, the, the environment's being destroyed. And they're kind of really beautiful because we know, like, you know, going back to being told for the first time when you're a kid that the most beautiful sunsets are a function of what used to be called smog, because it all does that, the, that a certain kind of beauty and bad things going together happen. So what's great about the Beshers right away is that that's not what they're doing. They're totally not. They are photographing something which is bad, in my view. Right, which is to say the complete subsumption of all production under the market. But they're not photographing it under the sign of, isn't this a terrible thing? There's no, there's no lamentation built into it. That's why I think Welling's phrase, down to the joy, administrative joy, is totally right. So where you find that in Bals? That would be a question. Maybe you, <laughs> maybe you can answer that one in doing this. I wanted, I wanted to ask a question about, um, given your, the theory of intention that you have set out a long time ago now and are now developing with respect to Anscombe and Davidson. If we look at the, um, I'm, I'm interested in the relationship between the form of the architecture in itself, if we call it architecture, yeah. building, um, and the 
views that they take of the work. And I know Jesus has spoken about the fact that they often take the orthographic shots or at 45 degrees, or they move around the object at 45 degree intervals. But it seems as though you could imagine them looking at these things and saying, well, you know, we need to get a point where we can get a little bit of air between the pipes so we see the pipeness of them, you know. Or if you go back to your very first um, slide, pretty much all of those, um, I, don't, I don't even know what they are, <laughs> those things <laughs> um, are taken quite obviously uh, in profile if, if that's what we call, if we think of them as animals, they're taken in profile basically to to because we seek get more information about the object. How do we understand? How do we understand that kind of um, cause, <laughs> if we want to call it that, but where the architecture kind of puts the photographer in a particular place in space with respect to the original object. How, like, how would we right. factor that with respect to the question of intention? Yeah, so, you know? I mean, I, maybe the way to put it be in two ways. I don't, didn't show any of, of what they call their industrial landscapes, which actually we're going to write about at length. Industrial landscapes are not individual functional things. They're pictures of whole steel mills, whole coal mines. They distinguish them. So this will be to get at two different forms of intentionality, really. That is, they say, when you're doing the industrial landscapes, the crucial thing is composition. So, you got, and you can see it. The whole point is, yeah, they're settled in these, like, valleys. They're wherever they are in, you know, like uh, Pennsylvania steel towns. And you've got to find the right place. And you've got to, like, locate the camera in the right way. And you've got to then do all the other things about the time of day and all that. So that if you think of them as, in effect, as landscapes, you then have the protocols of the landscape. And for them, the protocols of the landscape was that they're above all composed. But where composition means for them, not just where you put the camera in relation to, like, say, this, it means to get a whole sort of effect. So if you think about the origins of landscape, think about Poussin's landscapes, right? It's got a point of view and a point of view around which an entire natural world is formed, but also bordered. So you're seeing it as a kind of unity. So these are different, right? They're different because the, the, um, the, the point here was never exactly to find the best view from which to show you the thing. The point was to find the view from which to show you the thing which would enable you to display certain kinds of characteristics. So you said at the beginning, more information. So more information might be some. It's not always obvious that it's the more information you want. Maybe a lot of what you want from these is precisely the effect of profile and the ability then for anybody to do much more easily than we can with the blast furnaces, right? Look at them and see them all as belonging to a type, but as displaying different versions of that type. So clearly, completely do want that. And we know, right, that their work was heavily influenced by work in natural, in, 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 in botany, about actually showing plant types and showing the relations between them. So that's a kind of, so the point there would be is, yeah, what we're characterizing here in talking about their intention, and I, you know, I want to say, I mean, it is true that sort of against theory made this argument about intention, which was then controversial and is still controversial about whether that can be true about like language, at least. But in our way of talking about art, <laughs> it's uh, always been more or less inescapable. That is, because why? Because the minute you're saying, there's nothing, the, the question of what their intention is, is no sense different from the question, what are they doing? That's the real crucial point about this. What are they doing? That's why I say intention requires understanding. The question, if we ask the question, how does that appear to us? Then it will appear to us in different ways, and each of us can describe the way it appears to us, and it may appear differently from one of us to the other. But if you ask, ask the question, what are they doing? Then we're not talking about what we see. We're simply about what we see. We're talking about what we see insofar as what we see is something which we see as an action. So yeah, the intention there is going to be different from the intention with the, um, the industrial landscapes, but it's going to be, it's, it's, I mean, it's just they're doing something different. So how would you characterize what they're doing? Well, it's sort of to characterize. To, from my standpoint, what they're crucially doing here is precisely trying to produce as disconnected from their function, as, first of all, attached to their function. These things are only exist to do what they do. Second of all, disconnected from their function. So we're photographing them at a moment when we don't see the function, or we, don't, we can no longer, as it were, 
think of them as functional, and third, as displayed in a way that produces formal features of them, which for us, i.e. for us, the Beckers, Beckers are marks of art, are marks of actually um, what you were calling before um, uh, an aesthetic intention. So is that, and that has something in common with what they do with these landscapes, but is also different from what they do with the landscapes, since the landscapes function in a different way. Does that answer the question? Maybe not. I didn't, I'm not quite sure I understood the question then. <laughs> Well, it's a, well, I, 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 won't, I, won't, I won't follow up. We can, we can, I can, we can talk about it later. Does anybody else um, would like to? Over here, there are a couple. And back and then right here. Well, last two minutes. Um, the question is, can these things, I, I get the sense that these things aren't, these buildings you show here, aren't purely reduced to function in the same way that the aesthetics of a Formula One car can be reduced to function. It's still kind of latent aesthetic at play. So you look at that car in you know, the Formula One car, but there's a kind of aesthetic that's playing maybe perhaps in the subconscious, we could say, that these things are beginning to look beautiful in a way, right? And that beauty that's, that doesn't get reduced to prime function of speed. Right? And I, I would say that these buildings as well sort of operate in that same space where right. they are kind of irreducible, their forms are irreducible to sort of aesthetic agenda, yet you know, you, there's still that kind of beauty or you know, however you regard it, yeah, yeah, seeping totally. through beyond um, a kind of, um, I guess, framework of function. Yeah, so I think I do understand the point there. So here would be a way to put it. So the one thing, right, I sort of just said in passing that the Beshers don't want is form follows function. That is, the beauty is not the beauty of their function. I mean, some people think they do want that, but I, I, and the point of your example, I take it, was that if you look at the Formula One car, so I know nothing about Formula One racing, but like everybody else in the world, we've been watching the TV show, so I know a lot more about what they look like now. If you look at the Formula One car, it's like you'd say, well, it, it's beautiful because it's designed and tired to go as super fast as it can. But then you made an important point, I think, which is that, yeah, but you begin to see a sense of its beauty, which is not just linked to its going as fast as it can. So, but, for, but, but, that's a, but I don't think that's exactly what the Beshers are, in the end, interested in. Because that would be a beauty, then, as a kind of ornament. In other words, it's something that's beautiful about the thing, but it's not beautiful as part of its function. So there'd be kind of return of a certain, a sort of more sophisticated, kind of complicated, but still return of ornamentality. So what I think, and the reason I come back to the blast furnaces so often, right, is because what I think the actual interest in is a, an aesthetic that is not form-following function, although they obviously begin there, but it's not either the, like these things being made beautiful by looking at them differently, by seeing them separating from them, them from their function. It's rather that, that what emerges as the aesthetic is the moment in which the, 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 the effacement, you know, the erasure of one function, the function of what they performed to making steel, the function of what they performed making a profit, that function of being a profit identified with the kind of unintentionality, the consumer, the, the sovereign consumer, whether it's, whether it's the buyer or whether it's the reader or the beholder, that is replaced then by a refunctionality of the artist. So to me, it's not, you know, although as, as I say, and you're certainly right, they are beautiful, but to me the point of them is not that they're beautiful. The aesthetic moment is not, that's why we get the aesthetic better in the blast furnaces than in the cold tipples. Because the cold tipples are beautiful, you know, when arranged this way. And the, and the water towers are beautiful, but the blast furnaces are not beautiful. And the blast furnaces are not beautiful, but they absolutely are the kind of essence of what seems to me the aesthetic for the Beshers. So yeah, I totally take the point. And it's kind of complicated, because one of the reasons we all love about I mean, I never obey anybody. Maybe say, someone will say, I hate them. And you know, I can't argue about that. But I've never met anybody who didn't sort of think, no, they're kind of great. And we didn't think it's sort of the beautiful. But there's a way in which to begin to see them. And that's why the anonymous sculpture thing works, right? It's because you take these pictures of things, and then you think, yeah, I would never have seen how beautiful it was. And especially not till you put all six of them or nine of them together and saw them in relation to each other. So what I'm trying to do, though, is undo that and say, yeah, it's not that we shouldn't see that. But if we see that, we're not actually quite getting it. 
what we need to be getting to understand what they're doing is the way in which it's this kind of relation between functionality and the removal of functionality that makes the aesthetic. And that does it regardless of whether the thing is beautiful or not. So the beauty is kind of, in effect, an add-on. The beauty is, in the end, just ornamental. So we're going to get a whole question without anybody asking about disparity. Congratulations, or <laughs> I don't know whether I mean that as a kind of compliment or a criticism. Well, I'm not going to ask about that. <laughs> uh, I have a question, actually. I was wondering if you could elaborate on the question of context. I think you alluded to that a little bit, but I'm wondering how that plays into the system of aesthetics, because it's so obvious when you look at the works that you have shown, especially works such as this by Bernd and Hilla Becher, where the serial character is so poignant and the question of contextualization is pretty obvious to me and how that plays into the system of aesthetics or the absence so what, of context. So what do you mean by context, exactly? What do you mean by context? Or here it's pretty much the absence of context. So that right. plays into the intention of the maker. So yeah, the absence of context you mean because the buildings are themselves removed from their context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. No, I mean, I agree with that. That's something that people do say about quite correctly. I mean, the whole idea would be, again, is that they're not photographs of, well, I mean, it's different. So here's another project um, to, to give a sense of it, is that they don't always do that. The, 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 the industrial landscapes are not removed from their context. Indeed, the whole composition problem is to be able to show as much of the context as possible. Um, so the thing about the removal from context here, right, is that it produces this kind of pure form of the problem of function and then the pure dislocation from the problem of function. I mean, that's why every single one of these works, what is its name? Its name is the thing it is, right? You know, in other words, it's, it's, its name is Coltipple. <laughs> and, and, and its further name is Coltipple, you know, um, Braddock, Pennsylvania, 1982. So, in a certain sense, that's completely its context. It's the day they saw it, right, and what it looked like that day. In another sense, it's completely discontext uh, context because it like, could be. I mean, there's no way of knowing. It's like Sugimoto's, like you know, sees. If you look at, we were over the uh, Museum of Fine Arts today. They just have one, and they have a beautiful Sugimoto shot of a sea and the sort of light in the sea, and then they tell you where it is. Do you want to say? Yeah, no one has ever said oh, it looks just like that. It looks just like the the uh, the, uh, the Sea of Japan. They all look, I mean, they don't all look exactly the same, but the difference is the difference in photographs, not the difference in like the sea. No sea looks like itself in that. So these, they, they look like what they are, although you have to be told what they are, and they are indeed removed from the kind of context of production. They're removed from, um, they're highly functional, but removed <coughs> from the, the, the socioeconomic, like personal, um, cultural life. I mean, again, one of the things I love about the Beshers is that that decontextual is that there's no, the Beshers don't have the idea of culture. So this is like a huge upset grade. The, I mean, maybe the single most destructive idea for art, and certainly for thinking about art, in the last half century has been the idea of culture. And the idea that what art should do is represent a culture, or represent the kind of refusal of a culture, whatever. The Beshers don't even have the idea of culture. So part of what I take that to be is they remove it from like a certain kind of everyday life and put it instead into the, a framework which instead of culture, they have two ideas. The idea of, uh, of a function and the idea in effect of art. And therefore, what they produce is a kind of meditation on the question of function and art. And that, to me, is what the, dis the decontextualization is all about, rescuing it from the idea of, of. So for them, doing this in the 60s and 70s when they got started, the idea of the kind of anthropologization of art would not have been anywhere near as intense as it's since become more or less synonymous with certain kinds of art, artistic contributions. But, f but so uh, it wasn't like they were rescuing it from culture. They just like blissfully were blissfully ignorant of the idea of culture. But I, but I take that to be a part of is their sense that, yeah, we don't, we're not trying to show a way of life. Um, what we're trying to show is an economy. And we're trying to show an art object. 
and the kind of relation between the economy and the art object is precisely what replaces what would ordinarily be thought of as context. And that's true even in the industrial landscapes where you look at these towns, and if you know anything about this, right, if you look at the steel towns in Braddock, I mean, like Braddock, there, you know, the history of those steel towns, so there's a very brilliant photographer who does exactly the opposite way. So does anybody know the work of um, Latoya Ruby Fraser? Everybody here ought to know the work of Latoya Ruby Fraser, African American photographer now based in Chicago, but her first book, The Notion of Family, is like the most important book of photography published in the last 15 years. So she does it exactly differently. There are people in every one of them, but it's Braddock. I mean, there are places that she photographs, which are places where the Bechers photographed. Complete overlap, right? Um, but she does it exactly differently. You know, there are people in there. Half the pictures, notion of family, in the notion of family are pictures of her family. But she, too, kind of brilliantly disconnects her family from the idea of, like, in this case, African-American culture. For her, no, what she's photographing is precisely the economy. It's actually a striking thing about Fraser that she goes from photographing, I mean, like her, her portrait of me and mom is like one of the best photographs ever made uh, in, in the world, really. It's like an amazing photograph. And then she goes from doing that to doing portraits of couples in Charlevoix in Belgium, who like, I mean, the culture of Charleroi, if we're thinking about in our usual idea of culture, the culture of Charleroi in Belgium is not the culture of like African American culture in Brown, Pennsylvania. But if you're thinking about the political economy, it's the same political economy. Charleroi is one of the the Bechers photographed in Charleroi. Because Charleroi perfectly met the description of a place where all these fucking machines still work, but they don't work at a, <laughs> at a price that we can possibly pay for it. And of course, you know, I, I never say it here, but you can go without saying. The political economy, why does that matter? Because when those things moved, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people were put out of jobs. I mean, the American steel industry went from you know, employing like 600,000 people to employing like 300,000 people in 10 years. If you want to look at the world around you and ask who's voting for Trump, uh, that event, Stephen Shores just put out a really interesting book of photographs he took in the 1970s, um, which he didn't quite see the point of. But now someone has pointed out to them they have a point. And what their point is, like, you can take a lot of people in those photographs and put MAGA caps on them 30 years later. And why? Because, in fact, they belong to a part of the economy that has become increasingly um, uh, left behind. And, 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 and they have no way, in the absence of the socialist movement, of like, understanding what it means them to be left behind. They don't think that capitalism is a the problem. They think that immigrants are the problem. Right? They don't think that, uh, that um, profit is the problem. They think that black people are the problem or Jews are the problem. But the point about it is, is that there's, there's a material base to what that problem is. And Shore actually, Shore, when he made the photographs, I think has no idea what that is. Shore retroactively sees the photographs that way. But that would be the part of the point of the decontextualizing here. And these photographs are much better than the Shores because Shore, although they're actually great, he's a, obviously a wonderful photographer, but Shore's photographs are completely contextualized. You know, and in a way, they're only made to work now because they're given more context. See, these are the guys. Look at his son. That guy's son is going to be like going to the Capitol on January 6th. So you have to give this whole thing. Whereas the Bechers are kind of pure. You know, they completely are removed from that. But if you look at that and see what it is, you could like reconstruct the political economy of our period from, 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 from what I think is the correct understanding of those photographs. Would you like to remind us of tomorrow? <laughs> and then we'll thank both. Yes, so we will continue the conversation tomorrow and we will have um, great speakers who will present on different topics. Um, so yeah, I hope, we hope to see you all tomorrow for um, more uh, reflections on aesthetics, intention, and functionality. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.